just need to go over a couple of housekeeping items with everyone. Uh, as you'll see, you're on mute right now. We are encouraging questions though, so you can submit those via the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. If you run into any problems with today's presentation, please reach out via the chat function. I'll get back to you right away. Um, and during the presentation, there are a couple of polls which are gonna pop up on your screen. We ask that you answer those in a timely fashion so we can get the answers over to our presenter and to the rest of you. Now, now that our housekeeping's out of the way, I'd like to introduce our topic and presenters. Uh, this topic is more relevant than ever. I know in the last few months, the chart of my own investments kind of looks like a roller coaster, and we're all dealing with quite a bit of uncertainty in 2020. But today, uh, Richard and Matthew Vetter are going to help us control what we can control toward a better long-term investment experience in pursuit of the goals that matter to us. Now, Richard and Matthew Vetter, our presenters today, are portfolio managers with Mel Wealth Wealth Smart Securities of Aligned Capital Partners, Inc. Their wealth management process provides clarity and direction towards your goals, peace in mind, through the ups and downs and support along the way. Wealth Smart are very long-term members of the Chamber of Commerce and very active members of the business community here in Richmond. You may also know Richard from his regular column in the Richmond News. So without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce Richard and Matthew Vetter. Thank you so much, Shana. And, uh, Thank you for letting me jump the gun. <laughs> this is our first webinar. This is our first webinar and we're excited to do this. Mm -hmm. um, Matt, t tell us a little bit about yourself before we go. Well, firstly, I'm, uh, I'm Richard's son, as you can tell by the matching shirts. Um, but I'm also, <laughs> I'm also a portfolio manager with WellSmart Securities of Aligned Capital Partners. I've had a very interesting experience because most of my education actually came through osmosis, sitting at the kitchen table, having conversations with my father. Those are fun conversations, you know? Yeah. And mom, mom made them even more fun. Uh -huh. yeah. we, we named Wealth Smart for a reason. We played around with names and we, we needed to name a company for what we wanted to do. And, and several decades now, we, we've committed to educating our clients and the public about their finances. We've done a ton of workshops through the Richmond Public Library in the past. Mm -hmm. And uh, we know that life presents huge challenges, huge distractions that keep us from our goals. Yeah. And we've committed to helping people focus confidently on the goals, not just the regular goals, but goals that really matter. Uh, folks, your time is really precious to us, so let's dive right in, okay? Um, th this, there's going to be a lot of disclosures <laughs> along the way. We have to, but it's a good thing that we do because disclosures are designed to protect you from making uninformed decisions. Mm -hmm. And if we ever gloss through them too quickly, you haven't had a chance to read them, please reach out to us afterwards. We'd be happy to uh, explain them a little bit more. We're also gonna be uh, sending you a bunch of information afterwards, okay? Yeah. So there is, uh, there is a thing called a pinky promise yeah. and, or pinky swear. And it originated in Japan where it's known as yubikiri, okay? Which means finger cut off. And I'm sure Dan Sakaki will. will. Correct us on our pronunciation. I'm, I'm counting on Dan to correct the pronunciation because I'm sure I botched it. Um, it. Now, the pinky promise said that years ago, I mm -hmm. hope years ago, that the person who broke that pinky promise had to cut off their pinky finger. Like that was a severe, severe way to enforce um, accountability. Yes. Right? Yeah. To each other. Um, so I, I'm hoping we don't have to do that. Yeah. But... Our promise, our pinky promise, yeah. is that before this webinar ends, we're going to show you how to move toward the goals that matter with confidence, not just during this COVID-19 environment, but as a long-term strategy. Yeah. Pinky swear? Sure. Awesome. Let's go. Okay. So another thing is don't take any notes. Uh, we have tons of material we're going to send you afterwards that has so much of what we're talking about today. Just be present. Try, try to take in as much as you can during this webinar. Let's just have your, your focus on this. Speaking of focus, let's make sure that we I better do this too. Yeah. Cell phones. Okay. Make sure to mute them or put them on airplane mode or turn them off altogether because over the next uh, probably 40 minutes, uh, we've got some material here yeah. that you'll really want to pay attention. And to. you really get distracted too. I get very distracted. I have huge ADHD. Okay. Before we discuss where to find those extra rates of return over time, um, let's get the pulse of our audience on what you would trust when making 
investment decisions. Do we have a poll there, Shana? Good stuff. Yes, so you should see the poll on your screen now. Uh, we ask you to just uh, make your vote and uh, submit that to us. And we're gonna keep that open for about uh, 30 more seconds. So you should see it up on your screen now. All right, and it looks like we're getting a lot of responses back already. So I should be able to close it in five. So five, four, three, two. All right, and uh, you should see those results being shared on your screen now. That is really interesting. Okay, we're almost a split audience there on trusting Wall Street stock researchers or trusting Harvard financial scholars. I think regardless of your perspective, uh, you're going to get a lot out of uh, today's session because we're going to talk a lot about, um, you know, the value of research, the value especially of academic research. Yeah. Okay, um, so there's a thing that we call failure of the really smart people, and it begins I commonly with the investment fund prospectus, um, they've got disclaimers in them. Yeah. We used to get these monster disclaimers, right? Yeah. But folks that have bought mutual funds and other investments have found that recently they've refined them down to things called fund facts. Yeah. And even the fund facts has a thing at the end that says past returns are no indicator of future performance. Matt, why do you think they say that? Um, uh, probably because it's true. I think so. Yeah. 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 It's not designed to protect their, well, it's designed to protect their butts too, mm -hmm. but it's really designed because it's, it's true. We, we need to let people know that you can't tell the future by looking at the past. Yeah. Okay. Why then do so many people, including the really smart people, continue to try to pretend that they can predict the future yeah. or that they've got an edge over others uh, yeah. when picking stocks or even picking mutual funds? The evidence tells us on average that they fail at this. We fail at doing this. Yeah. We're going to dig into that a little bit more. But one guy in the investment industry we really respect, the late John Bogle, yeah. creator of the first index fund and founder of Vanguard Group, was one of the most highly respected voices in the investment world. So he was an avid investor. He was a money manager himself. He was a philanthropist. Yeah. He preached three things, investment over speculation long-term patience over short-term action yeah, and reducing fees as much as possible. Are we on the same page as John? I think we are. I think we are. Okay. I love this Labrador playing with the money. Okay. That'd be a disaster if that happened. Uh, so like this cute Labrador, everybody is guilty at one time or another of misbehaving with their money. It's true. Um, this includes investors, investment advisors, even professional investment managers. We move forward when we do things right, and we learn tons of valuable lessons when we do things wrong. The important thing is, let's not repeat the things that we learned that didn't go too well. Yeah, because okay. uh, that's, that's insanity. That's the definition of insanity. So let's talk about the common mistakes that we make. Yeah. So people try to, you know, predict the future. They um, pick stocks expected to perform well in the future. Yeah. They uh, move in and out of industry sectors. They try to time the markets. Yeah. All of these common approaches assume somebody's got a crystal ball. Somebody's a prophet out there. Yeah. But this is so interesting because one of the most common questions we get is, what do you think the market is going? Mm. What do you think of that? I have no idea. Yeah. And if I ever say that to somebody, I would ask them to just run in the opposite direction because I don't know anything about the future. Yeah. We like to uh, use this example. It's very similar to picking traffic and trying to get to your destination the fastest, but I'm going to use an even more stressful situation. You know, when we're checking out at Costco, mm. picking the right line. Yeah. How does that usually go for us? Well, we've had more than 30 years experience, <laughs> uh, starting with when Costco first opened up in Richmond here. Yeah. And mom has gotten to know those cashiers really well. Yeah. She knows the fast ones and mm. she knows the slow ones. And even she can't figure it out because guess what? If she picks a fast cashier, there's a bunch of other people that have been there for years and they, they know, okay, go into that lineup and we end up bogging down. Yeah. So if I pick it, if she picks it, if we know the cashiers, if we don't, i.e. inside knowledge, yeah. it doesn't work. Yeah. On average, we have a good experience or a bad experience, but on average, it's just average. So, and you know, to the point of the traffic here, 
Yes. This is like, I know that I don't win the lane changing game, but the little runt that's in there, like zipping in and out of traffic, trying to get ahead. Um, they don't get it right. Either. I mean, they get it right short term. Yeah. But there's a really high chance they're going to wrap their cars around a pole yeah. or end up in a gully or something like that. Yeah. That's risky behavior. Yeah. So you can do the same thing investing, do really risky behavior and catch a few wins. It can also blow up. Yeah. So picking the fast lane is just like, it's just like being in, in, in a Costco line or in traffic. It doesn't work. Yeah. People also act on impulse, don't they? Yeah. But let's, let's really put this in context because money is a very emotional issue. Like, that is our hard earned money. But unfortunately, our impulses and emotions were developed to keep us alive. Like a tiger in the bush, being aware of that and ready for that. But I'm gonna ask you a question. Do we make the best decisions when we're in an emotional state? No, no. If I have my own lions and tigers and bears that I think are out there, yeah. I, I'm, I'm, I'm lost. I need to calm down. Yeah. I need to think about things. I need to maybe sleep on something yeah. and then put my logic into gear yeah. and use, use, use proper logic instead. It's true. And the biggest part about this is human beings really, they're not wired for disciplined investing. And on the next slide, um, back. Oh boy, we're wrong, back. sorry. Yeah. <laughs> on this slide, we've probably heard all of these excuses mm -hmm. and all of these comments. But when people follow their natural instincts, they do uh, apply faulty reasoning to investing. One common example is, is something called hindsight bias. So think of all the situations where we look back in the past and we're like, I knew that, was, that stock was going to take off or I knew I should have gotten out of the market at that time. But did we really know? Not at all. Not at all. You, <clears throat> folks, you can see Matt lights up at this stuff. He, he did a degree in psychology and this, this stuff makes him happy, uh, but it's true. You know, we, 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 we get emotionally involved in our money. Things don't go too well. Yeah. We're not, we're not wired for it. Yeah. I love this because for the whole history of everything that you see here, I remember all these things. Now, granted, I was a teenager in the 1970s. Actually, wait. Yeah, I was a teenager in the 1970s. So the only experience that I had was not as a financial advisor then, but reading Time magazine mm -hmm. when it came across. And I remember the headlines. Arab oil embargo. Yeah. Stagflation. S&P down 43%. The death of equities and everything. But we, we, we have to look at a history like this and make a decision personally. Yeah. That if we see a dollar in 1970 turn into $83, okay, in, in 2019, end of 2019, we kind of have to agree that free enterprise works because mm -hmm. that's global commerce at work right there. That's the yeah. Morgan Stanley Capital Index uh, internationally. Now, um, we can be savers yeah. or we can be investors. Yeah. We can be really concerned about return on our money, yeah. like, like here, turning a dollar into $83. Yeah. Or we might be more worried about short-term return of our money. Yeah, right? and there's no shame in, in this decision. Um, and it really depends on the context of your life and your risk tolerances. So for example, if you need money in a, a short time span, you don't... No, you, you, you put guarantees in place, yeah. right? You put it into GICs or treasury bills, et cetera, yeah. right? Ah, people approach investing from get rich quick schemes, don't they? Yeah. Um, and a lot of our sources come from places like the constantly negative news net, uh, sorry, CNN, um, cable news network, or bad news, uh, the business news network, the mm -hmm. BNN, or mm -hmm. Facebook, yeah. or all the different feeds that we get there. And they're making a lot of money on us. Yeah. Every time we watch this stuff, mm -hmm. they're going to give us a lot of stuff that doesn't really matter. Yeah but we love to listen to. Yeah. So there's, there's, how about the social aspect of investing? Well, a lot of people like to talk about their winning investments, but it's also interesting that rarely are their, their losing investments brought up. Yeah. Right? And no, we don't remember those. Mm. There's no shortcut to growing wealth. So why do we keep investing this? Not all of us. Yeah. People, a lot of people. Yeah. Keep investing, I, right? I think in many cases, it's all many no, but we also have to consider that we always remember the exceptions 
more than what actually happens. Absolutely, absolutely. So people are swayed by the media and the media business model is, is actually pretty straightforward, mm -hmm. you know? It's number one, distract and attract. Yeah. And then once we got your attention, let's sell you something. Okay. So let's sell some mm -hmm. advertising. So what's the best way to get people's attention? Uh, something, uh, put something negative, something distracting, something sensational. Yeah. Um, that that I, I had a conversation once uh, over coffee with a, a news editor and, yeah. and I asked her, hey, um, is this true that if it bleeds, it leads? Yeah. She said, absolutely. She says, I'm not proud of it. But the fact is we sell more advertising when we have something sensational. Yeah something negative. Mm -hmm. um, that's just how we're wired, I guess. So we have to consider the motivations of the media before we consider the information that we get from yeah. it. We have to be discerning. We do. Right? And we have to remember one thing. Just one thing. Okay. Remember um, Curly? Maybe. Uh, City Slickers? Okay. The movie? Uh, Curly uh, was played by Jack Palance. And Mitch was played by Billy Crystal. Okay. And they're out in the desert. And Mitch is pretty scared because Curly's a, a scary guy. Yeah. Jack Palance. I mean, he's a cool guy, but he was scary, right? And Curly thinks, uh, Mitch thinks he's going to die. Yeah. So Jack Palance stops. Or Curly stops. And he says, get, just got to remember this. Just, and Mitch says, what, your finger? No, no, no. Hmm. one thing remember that one thing yeah everything else doesn't mean anything okay so mitch said well what's my one thing he said that's for you to figure out yeah so as investors in our investment approach we have to need we have to remember what that one key law yeah. and 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 the thing about that one key law is it's pretty simple yeah it's focus on what you can control but Every level of investment out there, yeah. no matter what, even the guaranteed investments, yeah. they have risk. Yeah, Guar it's true. You know, guaranteed investments have uh, risk that you're going to fall behind inflation. Yeah. Um, equity investments have risk of short-term fluctuation. Yeah. yeah. Um, since you have no control over the future, you have to control what you can control. Now, having said this cardinal rule of control what you can control, I'm going to break it down into 10 things that you got to remember. And, but we're going to give you copies of all this. So it's going to work. 10 different ways you can control what you can I know, control. I know. But we're going to subdivide this into 10 key points of that one thing, control yes. you can control. Yeah. The first thing is we got to embrace market pricing. Yeah. Now, there's $462 billion in trading volume, for instance, that happened every day on average in 2018 yeah. around the world. And it's probably higher now. Yeah. And with all of that trading going on, buyers and sellers, they bring new information to the market. The uh, companies that we're invested in, they're bringing new information into the market. They have to release that in information under continuous disclosure laws. Yeah. Everybody needs to know what's going on and they act on it. Nobody knows what the next piece of new information is gonna be. And the future is uncertain, yeah. but prices will adjust accordingly to new news. Yeah. And this doesn't mean that the price is always right. Like there's no way to prove that, but investors can accept market price as the best estimate of actual value. So we don't usually go to the supermarket and look at the groceries and think that's not the right price. I do. Oh yeah. Well, yeah. Some of us do. Well, I know. But we generally go there and we, buy, we pay what we pay. Yeah. We pay what the price is. Yeah. Exactly. We, we trust the price. Yes. Or we don't buy it. Yeah. yeah. Right? Um, so we, we've got a choice to make. We can either pit ourselves against millions of investors. Yeah. And or we can harness the market's power mm -hmm. just by accepting that information. Yeah. Right? I think that's the best way because together amongst the millions of investors, our knowledge is more powerful than any one of us yeah. all alone. There's a really good experiment that we like to reference to demonstrate this. It's called the jelly bean experiment. And what happens is at, a, at an event, there's a jar of jelly beans. And what they do is they have people try and guess how many jelly beans are in the jar. And the funny thing is, the more people you involve in trying to guess how many jelly beans are in the jar, the closer and closer you get to the actual number. 
So we actually did this at a couple of client events as well. Yeah. And it's remarkable. This thing works because the results, you know, there's a range, for instance, uh, in this case here, people guessed between 409, 5,365. Mm -hmm. The average guess was 1,653, but the actual count was 1,670. Yeah. Together, we are smarter yeah. than any one of us alone. And in almost all of those audiences, nobody got a guess individually that was even remotely close to that, that actual average, yeah. right? So you, you, you can try that in so many different ways, but the power of a community of investors yeah. is smarter than any investor all alone. Okay. You know, further to that thing of trying to, you know, time things. This is a little survey here um, of fund managers over time. And we use U.S. data for a reason. Uh, the U.S. stock market controls, it, it, it controls 54% of the world's stock market. Yeah. So it's huge. Yep. And the U.S. Uh, and, and its population and everything, its economy is so, so much bigger that it's got a bigger data set. Yes. So we're going to use that. So out of all of these investment managers here, 2,414 um, in 1990, 1999, if we would have measured their performance over the subsequent 20 years, mm -hmm. we would have found that 42% of them actually survived. Okay. So um, what happened to all the funds that didn't survive? Well, they didn't go bankrupt or anything okay. like that. But they, 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 a common thing that happens, and it's similar to what I'm tempted to do when I'm sweeping the kitchen is like I get all the dust together and there's a nearby rug. Yeah. And I'm so tempted to lift that rug up and yeah. just sweep them underneath the rug. I really hope mom's not listening. No, to this. no, actually we've got a, a, a vacuum that I use to pick it up afterwards, but I'm tempted, you know, yeah. but uh, what happens there is there's consolidation that happens. Yeah. Um, fund companies buy fund companies mm -hmm. and within fund companies, they have a multitude of funds and the ones that don't perform too well, they don't sell too well. Yeah. So they slide them in, they sweep them under the rug mm -hmm. by merging them in with other funds. So we actually don't see their performance. But once we ac accommodate all of those, you know, that survivorship bias, yeah. uh, it turns out that only 23% of funds at the end of that 20 year period um, actually beat the market. Yeah. And the biggest contributors to this underperformance are poor decisions, fees, and trading costs. Mm -hmm. And the same thing, by the way, happens with bond funds, with fixed yeah. income funds. It's actually even worse. Only 8% yeah. of them survive. Yeah. So don't try to outguess the market. That just doesn't work too well. Oopsie, skipped a slide. Um, no. And, oh, say one. Okay, good. Yeah, you're good. Good. Res now, same, same kind of a thing. If we take a look over a 20-year period and we measure you know, funds in a, a previous five years, yeah. like the, the ones that did well, the top quartile funds in a previous five-year period, and then we we see okay how did they do after mm -hmm. right only 21% of equity funds actually um, actually had a repeat performance mm -hmm. but the bulk like 79% they fell off yeah and so there's no telling from a a fund's past performance what it's going to do in the future yeah. and yet we take a look at the funds out there and we look at their morning star rankings morning star admits this they totally admit this. Yeah. They totally admit it's only a measurement of what happened in the past. Yeah. We gauge our, our investment decisions on who did the best over the yeah. past five or 10 years. Yeah. Well, let's take this down to uh, more practical levels. Remember when IBM was the computer genius company? Big, big Blue. And um, Apple wasn't doing so hot? They were in a garage. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What happened there? It flipped yep. completely. Now, remember back in the days when we used to think Yahoo was the future? That's what we, I looked up everything on Yahoo. Yeah. Yeah. Can you imagine saying, let's Yahoo that? I know, but that yeah. just doesn't sound the same, okay? So things change over time, and yeah. we can't look at the past. Um, and you got to be careful even when people give uh, proposals. Like if yeah. you're talking to different financial providers and they say, well, you know, we got a better, we got a better uh, situation here because, you know, our portfolio which they created using the best performers from the past five, 10 years did yeah. better than your portfolio. That actually doesn't work. Yeah. It's a really bad way of determining what the best investment approach is. You got to just let the markets work for you. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Um, most people look to the financial markets as their main investment vehicle because this has worked as we've seen over the you know, years since 1970. Yeah. Um, the, the markets represent capitalism at work in the economy. And historically, free markets have worked well in providing a long-term return that has offset inflation. So yeah. if we take a look here, back in 1985, if we would have needed a dollar to keep pace you know, with spending and stuff, we'd need $2 today yeah. for, uh, to buy the same kind of basket of goods that we bought in 1985. Yeah. Now to keep ahead of that, well, we could say, okay, I can buy treasury bills yeah. that are like GICs, and that's fairly safe, short-term GICs. But when we subtract inflation and we subtract taxation out of that, we're behind the eight ball. Yeah. We're, we're below inflation. We could also say, well, maybe government bonds. Mm -hmm. That's a little bit better. Yeah. But still, when we subtract inflation, subtract taxation, we're kind of going broke safely. Yeah. Right? It's, it sounds really safe. Short term it is, it yeah. is, but long term it's not too safe. What's really good long term is we take a look at world equities. Yeah. We turned a dollar from 1985 into $23. Yeah. Financial markets work over time, but you know, you gotta be careful. Yeah, I do really have to emphasize that it does come back to your own situation and your own risk tolerance. Yeah, yeah. Right? And, all, and, and, and depending on what the goals of, yeah. you, you know, what you wanna do. If it's a three year goal, yeah. I wanna buy a car. Yeah. Well, you know, choose the T-bills or, or the GICs or things like that. Now, we've already said stock picking doesn't work too well. Um, and trying to tell the future mm -hmm. doesn't work too well. But what we really need to understand is where do we extract those extra returns from? Because mm -hmm. we can. Yeah. We can understand where they come from. And what's happened in the past few decades is this evolution of financial science that has created um, the four-factor model. Yeah. Like number one, equities, stocks perform better than bonds. Yeah. Number two, uh, small companies in the long run perform better than big companies. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that's simple. Like Apple was a tiny company at one time, became a very big company. Yeah. Same with Google became, yeah. you know, they started off in garages, yeah. small to large. You yeah. got a bigger span there. Number three, um, less expensive companies mm -hmm. outperform more expensive companies, mm -hmm. i.e. value companies. And number four, now this sounds intuitive, like, duh, yeah. profitable companies beat less profitable companies. Really? Yeah. But I mean, that makes sense. But why are we out there buying companies that are actually low profitability and really high, uh, you know, prices? And in some cases aren't even making money. Hmm. There's a ton of them out there. And many of them are kind of in Silicon Valley, you know, and places like that. But we're looking at a bigger future. Yeah. And, um, you know, the, the fact is that in the long run, it doesn't work as well as tilting your portfolios towards cheaper companies, uh, smaller companies and more profitable companies. We'll get into that in a little bit in terms of fixed income in bonds. Longer term bonds, you get a better interest rate than shorter term bonds. Yep. Um, uh, bonds that are like corporate bonds, which are riskier, yes. reward us with a better interest rate yeah. than government guaranteed bonds. Yeah. And uh, we often get differences with currency fluctuation too. So that all, that all impacts uh, the returns within bonds and yeah. with equities. Now, when we're, when we, if we know that and when we're designing a portfolio, there's ways that we can design the portfolio to take advantage of those extra factors, yeah. those extra uh, things that give us extra returns. Yep. And in this case, the market is the market, you know, on the left column. Yeah. Uh, that's all the stocks, for instance. Mm -hmm. We can then say, okay, we know that smaller companies are going to give us better returns than bigger companies, but we don't want to blow ourselves up yeah. because they do carry more risk. Yeah. So let's just tilt a little bit into small. Okay, like emphasize those stocks that are small, yeah. buy a bit more of them. And then it, with price, we, we emphasize and buy a little bit more of the companies that are more affordably priced than the more expensive companies. It's like when, when we go shopping, I just always go for the sales, right? But sometimes I buy some things regular price, yeah. but I generally I tilt towards the sales price. And profitability, we tilt towards those companies that are uh, more profitable 
on yeah. average, okay? And when we do all of those with that trifecta of tilting towards small, tilting towards value, tilting yeah. towards profitability, in the long run, we end up with a better investment experience, okay? Bit of a quiz now. Shane, have we got another quiz there uh, on determinant of portfolio performance? All right, should be popping up on your screen any moment now. Yeah. And again, uh, if we can just ask everyone to vote when they see that on their screen. So when you're picking it, when, when you're looking at a portfolio, what do you think is going to be most responsible for portfolio performance? Picking the stocks, picking the right stocks, or asset allocation? All right, and uh, we're gonna do five more seconds. Five, four, three, two, thank you. Fantastic. There we go. Okay. Well, regardless of your answer, you're gonna be really astounded with the results. Um, or you might not be, actually, for some of you. The fact is, according to some studies done by Ibbotson and a few others in the past, um, in portfolio performance, 90% of the results have been attributable to asset allocation. Mm -hmm. You know, the what sectors that you're invested in and the diversification of those sectors. We're going to send some more information on that in your package. So thank you very much for participating in that quiz. Um, so, speaking of which, diversification, yeah. here's diversification. Yeah. Um, so... Uh, you, you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, a, a lot, um, a pretty big portion of Canadians, they have a lot of their wealth in Canada. And I understand this because we want to invest in things that we know and that are familiar to us, right? I'm patriotic. Yeah. But not that much. Hmm. Canada's got 4% of the world's stock market capitalization, between 3 and 4%, yeah. depending where our economy is sitting. Right now, it's closer to 3 actually. But over time, we found that, as you see in this slide, over the past 20 years, up until the end of 2018, the annualized return of the TSX composite, the Canadian stock market, was 8.06%. Mm -hmm. The standard deviation, and by the way, the higher that standard deviation number that's not good. Yeah. That's more risky. Yes. The higher the returns number, that's good. Yeah, that's good. We, we want that. Okay. And, but with a diversified global portfolio, yeah. over that period of time, we had a 9.46% rate of return, mm -hmm. but lower standard deviation. Does that mean global stocks are less risky than Canadian stocks? No, it just means that we're diversified among so many of them yeah. that we spread that risk around and yep. reduce our overall risk. Yep. Right now, I'm not saying that in the long run, global stocks are going to do better than Canada. I think if we take a longer sampling period, 50 to 100 years yeah. sampling period, I think you'll find that the stock returns of developed countries will be very, very similar across the board. Yeah. Canada has had its day mm -hmm. in resource sectors. The past decade hasn't necessarily been that case. Yeah. Right. But around the world, every economy has its seasons. On average, I think we're going to get great rates of return in the long run with lower volatility when we diversify globally, Yeah. right? Oh, this is good. Diversification reduces risks that have no return. Um, in a case like this, it is really bad idea to diversify um, in one stock. Yeah. Okay. And I think there's, there's plenty of examples of this. For example, uh, Nortel. Nortel, yep. yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, we, I, I just scrapped our Nortel phones just a while ago. Yeah. They just don't exist anymore. Right? Yeah. But they used to comprise one third of the value of the Toronto Stock Exchange. Mm -hmm. And when they slid, a lot of people's fortunes slid with it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, in the seventies, I think it was the seventies, Massey Ferguson was a really big player in agriculture, yeah. agricultural equipment. They bit the farm too. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Um, give me some other ones. Confed Life. Yeah. Confed, one of Canada's biggest insurance companies. Yeah. You know, um, at one time, uh, I think it was DEC Computers. Yeah. De no, NEC, NEC Computers. Yeah. Was a leader, was yeah. a global leader. What about uh, Kodak? Kodak and Polaroid. Yeah. They, they just didn't get behind digital technology. Yeah. So they, they were left in, in the dust as well. Yeah. We don't, like if we, 
if we continue to focus on company by company, we're exposing our portfolios to a lot of risk. The best thing is diversify amongst many. Mm -hmm. There we go. So I'm going to ask you a question. Hmm. This is the returns of the market. Oops. The previous one. Yep. Spoiled it. <laughs> this is the returns of the market, but can you see a pattern there? There's no pattern. Yeah. I, I can't see a pattern at all. Okay. So let's, let's maybe look at the next slide, which yeah. is the returns of the global economy. Can you see a pattern there? Uh, zero pattern. Yeah. Just doesn't exist. I can't find it anywhere. Yeah. I don't know what's going on here, but if, if we, I would have expected the U S to be on top a lot more often. Yeah. Um, but actually Canada has been on top more often than the U S in this period. Mm -hmm. um, we've had Finland three times. Yeah. We don't know where the returns are going to be coming from next. No. So the important thing is we have to, we have to be there when they happen though. Yeah. And the only way to be there when they happen is to allocate a portion of our portfolio into all the different areas for the best effect yeah. in order to capture the returns where and when they happen. Yeah. So again, can no you pattern. see a pattern here? There's no pattern at all. Yeah. Annual returns by market. We have to capture returns where they happen. So yeah. we avoid market timing. Invest in asset classes right across the board. The, the perfect diversification for me mm -hmm. is actually about 10,000 different global stocks, which is a lot. Yeah. And yet I see portfolios out there that might just have a dozen. Yeah. Oh, this is a, this is a tough slide because investing goes between two emotions. It goes between fear and greed. The unfortunate thing of how many people invest is as we approach elation and op optimism to elation, that's when a lot of people are thinking to buy. That's when a lot of people are buying. And then we get nervous and then there starts the fear. And that's when a lot of people sell. And this is how we unfortunately get that example of buying high mm -hmm. and selling low. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Matt, we did a little experiment years ago um, when you were still in, I think, university mm -hmm. and you were working part time yeah. in a business. And I had you do a little bit of research and we went to Investment Funds Institute of Canada. Yeah. And uh, we extracted data from all of their numbers. And Investment Fund Institute of Canada shows uh, not just investment performance, but they show net sales or redemptions of mutual funds. They yeah. show they show when people bought lots and lots of stock funds, yeah. and when they bought lots and lots of, uh, or when they sold lots of uh, stock funds. Yeah. So when we looked at Canadian, U.S., and international funds, and we asked the question, when are people buying lots? Well, they're buying when the market's high. Yeah. The data shows us that. When are they selling lots of funds? when the market's low. So on average, mm -hmm. we're showing that people's net performance over time is not so good yeah. because they're maybe because of poor guidance, maybe just misinformation, just panic. They're buying high and yeah. they're selling low. It doesn't yeah. work as a long-term strategy. <clears throat> Actually, Warren Buffett said it best, and I don't like to follow it to the law, but he says, we like to be greedy when peer people are fearful. And we like to be fearful when people are greedy. He just takes the opposite approach and it's worked out quite well for him. Okay. Look beyond the headlines. We know this. Just don't trust the headlines. Don't trust, distract and attract. It doesn't work as yeah. a long-term strategy. Yeah. And focus on what you can control. That's all you can do. Yeah. Get back to that focus on what you control here. Um, there is one missing piece uh, that we have to pay attention to but i'm going to tell you what the obstacle is to the missing piece first okay okay what's the missing piece no plan oh oh that's that's the obstacle oh okay okay that's yeah. the obstacle yeah so what do you think the missing piece is um Probably to get a plan. I think so. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's really you, you got to have a plan. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I'm, I've got a quiz going on here. So Shana, there's another quiz. Awesome. Thanks, Shana. See it pop up on your screen. <clears throat> what percentage of Canadians have a written financial plan? Three choices. Pick the one you think is closest. All 
All right, and we've got many responses back. I'm just gonna keep it open for another five seconds. So five, four, three, two, and thank you. Thank you so much. Let's see the results. Ah, okay. So percentage of Canadians that have a written plan. 34% said, oh, sorry, 57% said 34% have a written plan. 51% said 43%, 43% 51%. Yeah, this is confusing. Okay. Uh, thank you so much, folks. Well, the, you're, you're actually pretty darn close here because the folks that said 51% yeah. are actually um, correct partially, okay? Mm -hmm. Because the question was, um, there was a bank that uh, that did the survey, and they said, how many people have a financial plan? 51% said, got a financial plan. Yeah. But they had a follow-on question yeah. to that financial plan, because we didn't, remember, we didn't say written, we just said a plan. Yeah. Out of those people who said they had a financial plan, one third of them admitted that the plan was in their head. Mm -hmm. How do you think that works? It's a great plan. It's a, uh, no, no, no. You got to have it written. You got to have a formal written plan. So 34% of Canadians actually have a written plan. And if you're, if you're one of the many who don't, yeah. you know, or it's not current, you're not alone. Don't yeah. feel ashamed at that. Okay. Two thirds of Canadians have no written financial plan. And that's a tragedy. We're here to change that. Okay. That's what we want to do. Uh, but before you get into a written financial plan, any kind of a financial planning process, there are three secrets yeah. that you have to follow. Yep. Okay. They're mindset secrets. Yes. The first one is we have to transform confusion into clarity. Yep. Secondly, we have to turn obstacles into progress. Yep. And we've, we've got a process for all of these in what we do, you know, and it's, it's refreshing when it happens. And we have, we have to replace fear with confidence. Yeah. So back to transform confusion into clarity. Yeah. Yeah. It's hard to pursue your goals, especially the goals that matter to you when you don't know where you're starting from. And Absolutely. I think that's a big step of clarity. Yeah. 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 It's like a, it's like having a GPS and you're not pinned to where you are. Yeah. You're just going to go around in circles. Yeah. Right. So you have to know where you are yeah. uh, and turning obstacles in the progress. That's just taking the obstacles and taking them one by one. Okay. Obstacle number one, what's the deal here? What kind of a strategy mm -hmm. can I use to get over this obstacle? And what's the next logical step that I can take? Yeah. Okay. It's just step by step taking care of it. Replacing fear with confidence. The confidence comes. Yes. Yes. The, the confidence comes, but you can't have it right away. A lot of people procrastinate in doing anything that moves them forward. Mm -hmm. Because you want confidence first. Yeah, yeah. And there's a, there's a fellow, Dan Sullivan, who runs Strategic Coach. And he taught us the, the four C's that are so yeah. important in, in creating confidence. And the, and the thing is, number one, yeah. we have to have a commitment yeah. to move forward. Yeah. We just got to decide. Yeah. Okay, let's do this. That's true. Secondly, we have to take on courage. These two first steps are difficult. I love it when you do it. Yeah. Like courage and commitment. I don't like it when I do it. You know, but I hate it when I do it. Because <laughs> it's, it's just uncomfortable. But I love it in other people, right? Yeah. But you got to go through the steps. You got to yeah. take on commitment. You got to take courage. And guess what you, you get when you do that over and over? Practice. Well, capabilities. yeah. Capabilities. Yeah. You get capabilities. And, you know, I've taken on commitment. I've, I've decided to do something. I'm, I'm getting courageous. Yeah. And I've got some capabilities now. Do mm -hmm. you think I feel confident? That comes. Yeah. You can't do it the reverse way. Yeah. It's ab actually impossible. So we're approaching the end here, and I got to ask folks right here um, yeah. Are you feeling a little bit overwhelmed at all of the stuff we've presented? It's been fast. I acknowledge that. Um, are you really, really busy in business and you know, you can't quite focus on the financial plan and stuff? And are you maybe thinking that maybe I should? Shouldn't be my own financial planner? Well, we've got one big question for you. Would you like some help with that? Because that's something that we do. Mm -hmm. We have a process that we call the Dream Navigator. The Dream Navigator was built to deliver financial confidence, yeah. to give clarity and direction towards the goals that matter, mm -hmm. to uh, bring peace of mind yeah. through the ups and downs. And I think the most important one is this. Support. Just, yeah. Absolute support along the way. Yeah. Okay. Because without that, it's just, you know, you establish a financial plan and then you think it changes. 
well, the financial plan is going to be obsolete probably the day after you set it in stone. Yeah. The trick is continuing to iterate on that using agile planning along the way yeah. to adjust through the ups and downs because life will change. Life will throw curveballs. Yeah. It'll throw opportunities your way and you have to deal with it. Yeah. So the ways that you can get started in doing this, and we've got a few ones, they involve no commitment at all. You don't have yeah. to worry about engaging with us, but just use us for what you can. You can do all of these, yeah. but I'd say, you know, do at least one. Sign up. Oh, by the way, Wealth Smarts, we've had this going, Matt, um, together. Two years? More than two years, yeah. since April of 2008. Yeah. We actually wrote our first Wealth Smarts when we were on a train yeah. in Europe, yeah. right? And I think we launched it yeah. while we were in Europe. So uh, sign up for Wealth Smarts. It's one weekly tip to take you one step closer to your dreams. Yeah. And it's usually a one minute read as yeah. well. Get a quick start on your financial plan online. We've engaged uh, with technology provider plans well, and uh, we've got a link that we're gonna email you that allows you to establish your financial plan really, really quickly. It's not gonna be a perfect plan, yeah, but you're gonna be 80% there. It's gonna start off a financial plan conversation. Yeah. You're gonna get some results that are gonna really astound you. Maybe you might not be surprised, but give the, give the link a try. There's no obligation at all. Yeah. And again, you can schedule a focus finder consultation with us. Mm -hmm. We're going to provide a link to our calendar that you can do that. Yep. Um, but do all of these, I think it would be awesome. Like that would be like, you'd be a real keener if you did them all, but do at least one as a follow up on this whole, whole webinar that we've had here today to get you going, to get you to build up some forward momentum. And I think now Shana, we've got some time for Q and A. We do, and uh, thank you to everyone who submitted questions so far. That Q&A is still open, so if you've had any questions come up uh, during the event, please still submit them. Um, so I will just direct the questions to you guys. Okay. Uh, first one is from Phil W. This should be easy for you guys. Uh, what does price to book mean? Oh, that's a really good question because we're throwing around all these valuation, um, uh, all of these valuation uh, um, uh, to uh, topics, etc. Yeah. Price to book, the way I can equate that is if I have a company, let's just say it's a technology company, and let's just say it's something like an Uber, and I actually have no bricks and mortar. I don't have any cars, because Uber uses other people's cars. All I got is a platform that's sitting on a server somewhere. So I have very few physical assets, but I got a lot of intellectual assets. But the future ability for me to earn money, maybe not during these COVID times, but the future ability for me to earn money is, is exponential, mm -hmm. you know, with a lot of risks, of course. So the book value of my company is going to be quite low. Let's just say, I, I don't know, let's just say it's going to be a billion dollars. But the goodwill of my company, the promise of generating a return, the today value of the future revenue is going to be like 10 billion. Yeah. Well, the, uh, the price, uh, the, the book, you know, the book to market ratio is going to be 1 billion of book value, physical assets to 10 billion of, uh, uh, of goodwill, the ability of the company to generate revenue. Mm -hmm. So I hope that explains it. Thank you. That uh, that helped me understand it too. And uh, Phil W, please write in if uh, you need any more clarification here. You betcha. Um, now, Matthew, I think this might be a question that you can really help us with, with your psychology background, but uh, how can I avoid sunk cost fallacy with bad investments? Hmm. Sunk cost fallacy. So basically sunk cost fallacy is the idea of selling a bad investment, right? It's, it's, and part of it is, part of it is, it's psychological because it's hard to admit our mistakes, right? Um, but it is an emotional issue, of course. And with any of these emotional issues, there needs to be a little bit of detachment, if that makes sense. Um, how... So Shana, you just typed, the, the, you'd like to answer that question live? What do you mean by that? Oh, no. So I, I just flagged that so that the folks uh, watching on their computers can see the question after it's been answered. Yeah. I think a good example of sunk cost fallacy, maybe lately, has been Warren Buffett with his airlines. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, he got into Delta. Yeah. And then he just got out. Yeah. You know, he just decided, 
it, it, it was a bad idea to begin with. Okay, yeah. it, it, let's just get out of this altogether. And this was, this was when the price had dropped even more. But there was also, in this perspective, in that case for Warren Buffett, he knew that these airlines had become so leveraged that a lot of their future earnings would be going towards trying to get them out of the hole and trying to, trying to continue paying off their debts, right? Mm-hmm. So some cost fallacy is basically the idea of throwing good money after bad, right? You know, I've, I've, I personally, I hadn't really run into the concept of sunk cost fallacy. Mm -hmm. So if there was further discussion on that, like we could have that offline, certainly, yeah. you know, oh, we could certainly okay. go by email and we can research it a little bit and maybe yeah. have a better discussion afterwards. Yeah. Thanks guys. All right. Moving right along. Um, here's a good question. Uh, yeah. If a person's income hasn't changed yet, but he's worried it may go down soon, what would you suggest he change in his investment strategy, if anything? Oh boy, that's really good. Because let's just say there, for example, let's just say there might be a pending layoff. And um, it might be a good idea to make sure we have as much in liquid investments as possible. Yeah. If there's a tax-free savings account, um, that's a good one to draw from. Even an RRSP in a very, very low rate environment, a very, very low income environment, can be something that you can draw from. Yeah. Right? It's sort of a last resort. Yeah. I'd also make sure that we um, make sure to open up any uh, uh, any uh, real estate based lines of credit. You know, like a mortgage based line of credit as a last resort. Yeah. Um, we have yeah, we yeah. have something called the triangle of wealth. Yeah. Yeah. Would you like to explain that? The triangle of wealth makes sure that you know you've got you paid off non-deductible debts. Yes. Like that would actually be another good method. Make sure the non-deductible debts are done, especially credit card debt. Yeah. Um, and then once we're on the road to no credit cards, we can put aside some liquid savings. Yes. And these liquid savings are designed for times like these when somebody might be worried. How much would you income. recommend, do you think, in, in living expenses for the year? What's a good amount? Uh, ideally, six months of living expenses mm, yeah. right, would, be, would be perfect. A lot of people might say six months living expenses and savings, or at the very least, have a line of credit that allows you to draw that much in a very dire circumstance. Yeah. Um, I would uh, consider reallocating investments that, for instance, if somebody had one of these balanced funds that was a 60-40 portfolio, 60% uh, equities, 40% fixed income, maybe split them apart. Mm -hmm. Maybe take that 60-40 60, that 60, portfolio and take 60% of that, put it into an equity fund that's very similar, and 40% of it, put it into a fixed income fund that you can draw on yeah. without impacting the value of the equities. Yeah. There's a number of different strategies. And certainly if you had questions on, uh, you know, more granular ways of doing that and planning for that, we'd certainly be uh, available to have a conversation. Mm -hmm. Thank you. It sounds like there's a lot to dig into there. Um, all right. And this is the last question that's come through. So again, if you have any other questions, uh, throw them in and I think we've got time. Um, last question I've got is why is the market continuing to perform well with so much unemployment at the moment? What are your thoughts? It did take a quite a dip. It did. Yeah. Yeah. But that's, that's basically as a result of companies realizing that, well, we're going to be behind the eight ball. People aren't going to have, have as much to spend. Right. But then we had this bounce back. Yeah. And we're thinking, okay, people are still unemployed yeah. and they're not able to spend the kind of money they can spend, but we have to understand that the market doesn't necessarily adjust to what's going on today. Yeah. Okay. It, it, to a degree it does. The market adjusts according to um, what it expects future earnings from companies to be in the future. And investors are looking like five, 10 years down the road. They're knowing that, I mean, no, absolute certainty, we're going to get out of this, you yeah. know, if, if we behave, you know, under, you know, social distancing, and washing our hands and stuff like that. But if we put a lot of money into research to find um, cures to treat people who have the illness and vaccines to prevent us from getting us mm -hmm. getting it, we're anticipating we're going to have solutions to this within two years. Yeah. And when that happens, we'll be largely back to normal. And we're expecting those future earnings to continue. So the markets have taken a haircut now of about 10% of where they were like in February. 
And that simply reflects that, hey, you know what? Over the next five years, five plus years, we expect that earnings are going to be on average, maybe 10% lower than they were pre-COVID, right? Hope that answers your question. Thank you so much. Um, so I know I've learned a lot today. I'm sure all of our guests have too. Um, before my closing remarks, do you guys have anything to wrap it up? You betcha. Um, let me just click on my thing here. There we go. Ah, thank you, folks. So thank you, everybody, for your attention. Yeah. Um, we are going to email you a bunch of things as a follow-up. We're going to get you slide handouts. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to get you a handout also. It's not on here called um, Towards a Better Investment Experience. And we're going to have a bunch of follow-up links for you, okay, to take action on. And that's about it for us. This has been a really good experience. I really thank you for the opportunity. I can't believe this is your first webinar, your pros. Thank you. Um, <laughs> thank you so much, Richard and Matthew, uh, for sharing all of the amazing information today. You're welcome. Uh, I hope everybody has learned something today. I know I have. Uh, before we part for the day, I'd love to plant a seed with each of you. Uh, nominations are now open for the 2020 Business Excellence Awards. I know each of you probably knows at least one amazing business here in Richmond. Of course, in 2020, success can look very different to how it looked in 2019. So the awards this year are pivoting to really focus on resilience rather than strictly financial success. Uh, it really only takes a minute or two to make the nomination. There are 10 categories you could nominate a uh, business for an award in. You can find all of the information available on our website at richmondchamber.ca and you can nominate your own company if you like. So thank you again so much. Um, we really appreciate you joining us today. If you missed anything on this webinar and want to catch up on it, it will be available on our, the webinar library on our website. Thanks very much, Thank everybody. You so much. Thanks, guys. Have a great day. You too.